This week I'm joined once again by Professor Paul Bishop, who is the author of multiple books on the work of Carl Jung and Friedrich Nietzsche, alongside other texts on analytical psychology and German thought. In this episode, we discuss Carl Jung's The Red Book, Liber Novus, alongside discussions on religion, belief, mysticism, symbolism, and more. I'd like to thank all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support Emetic's podcast or become part of the community, please find links in the description. Enjoy. Uh, so, Paul Bishop, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetic's podcast once again. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back. Uh, this time we are we are talking about someone a bit more familiar, not Ludwig Klages this time. Uh, we'll be talking about Carl Jung, um, but specifically one book of Jung's which is um, sort of infamous, notorious, elusive. The Red Book, Liber Novus. Um, which I won't even try to sort of describe in one sentence. Uh, but before we jump in with the book, um, just tell us a little bit about your sort of relationship with Jung's work. Um, and I believe you've you've written a, more than one book on Jung, haven't you? I've been I've, I've been trying to work out what um, C. G. Jung is about for for a, for a good number of years. Um, and um, in fact, I was um, not that I was fed up with him, but there are lots of other people that, like the Ludwig Clark, as you've mentioned, um, uh, that I want to work on. But 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 I keep on getting pulled back uh, to Jung, and, um, and 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 the Red Book is a a giant sort of a magnet uh, uh, to pull you back. Um, and I think that it's probably not only reignited my own interest in Jung. Um, and enthusiasm about his work and appreciation for what he has to say to us. Um, but I think it's also had that effect more widely. And that um, post the publication of the Ray book, um, there has been well, not just a renaissance of Jung studies, but I think a, a, a new and more more widespread appreciation of, of his significance for our time. How would you describe the Red Book? Uh, well, it's a book <laughs> and it's red. That's about the simplest description you could give. Uh, it's, Without, quite expensive, yeah. it's quite expensive, <laughs> too. Um, uh, but, but, but worth every penny. I mean, I mean it, it is a big, uh, it's a big red book. Um, so, so nothing. Don't get confused with um, with Mao Zedong. And it's been published uh, 2009 um, under the editorship of Sandra Sh- uh, Shantasani. Um, and, and what that offers is a, a facsimile form of a project uh, that Jung undertook really to kind of recreate the medieval world and and create a kind of modern or postmodern medieval manuscript. It's as as crazed and crazy and convoluted and complicated and contradictory as that. It's a fascinosum. It's it's an extraordinary thing. Um, I should say as well, there's also a reader's edition that's come out, um, but that hasn't got the pictures. That is actually the edition that I've got. So I did feel uh, that I've uh, I've missed out, but I, I did... Uh, I have spent some time with the the sort of original edition as well. Um, so it was. So you say it was Jung's attempt at a medieval manuscript. Is this the purpose as to why it was written, or was there other reasons? From from what I've understand of sort of the the biography of this book is that it was a ten year long, expansive notebook of Jung's of a sort. That's that's right. Um, it's well. If we trace it back to, to to what we know, and of course it's it's very hard to reconstruct the origins of the of the book because we have the book itself, we have the the preliminary workings of it um, in the form of the black books that we might want to talk about, um, and uh, we have uh, Jung's own accounts of how he came to wrote it, how he came to write it, but, but of course, as with all these things, what really happened, we don't know. Um, and yet there it is. It is evidence that something had happened. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. And it is, shall we say, a uh, the protocol of of experiences or visions or imaginings or some kind of encounter with the unconscious. That's what Jung wants to have us believe um, uh, that happened to Jung uh, beginning at about 1913 to 14. And as you say, he then uh, works on it for a number of years. And I think those things are, uh, those two aspects are important, both the spontaneous, unconscious source of the book, but also the fact that it has been worked up, uh, sculpted, we might say, um, it has been elaborated. So it's, it's, you could say, both nature and culture. 
um, it's not simply an, an, an effusion, but it is a working out and an engagement with that experience. And of course, that experience is the fascinating thing and it's so very hard to connect with. But I think Jung is going to give us some kind of a sense of what it would be like to go into the collective unconscious, go mad and come back again. And it's those both those things. It's the losing control, but also the taking back control, the working out of the experience. And that's what makes it, for me, this red book, ultimately a work of art. Not all Jungians, I think, like that sense of it, um, but I would say, you know, you just have to read the poetry of the, of the text. Um, you just have to look at the artwork or some of the artwork. And for me, that makes it a work of art. And that's not to reduce it, that's to give it its full and absolutely splendid status as something sui generis. And of course, all art is sui generis. No work of art is, a genuine work of art is like another. In terms of the biography of Jung and in terms of Jung, scholarship it's my understanding and i might be completely wrong on this that there was quite a long time where jung was sort of there was a almost like a balancing act between people who understood jung in the occult framework people who understood jung in the psychoanalytical framework and he was sort of held in the psychoanalytical framework with a reluctance to admit to that other side of his work was the publication of the red book sort of the final and i don't mean this in a crass way the final nail in the coffin in terms of no longer being able to avoid the fact that Jung had extreme interest in the mystical, in the occult, or what we might know generally as the occult. Yeah. Um, well, of course, um, picking up that phrase, nail in the coffin, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Zaratustra says, only where there are graves are there resurrections. And, and, and I think it, there's been a sort of a quantum leap in our understanding of Jung, well, maybe our misunderstanding of Jung, uh, since the publication of this book. Um, but I think you're right that there are, I mean, maybe, maybe we could say that there are sort of a three strands of, of, of reception. Um, uh, there is the psychoanalytic one, which has become a praxis, uh, which is becoming an institution. You, know, you have the Jung Institute, you have, you have other Jungian organ organizations, um, and you therefore have a therapeutic uh, practice as, as well. Um, so that, that's one stream of reception. Uh, there is, as you say, also the sense of Jung as, as um, an called adept, uh, as, as, as a mystic. Um, but one can simply say someone who's not a therapist, just put it, just put it in there, it's someone who deals with experiences of the, of the numinous. Um, but I was going to add a third one, um, in that there has been an increasing academic, I think, reception of, of Jung. Um, I've tried to do my modest bit on that, but uh, there are many other people who have published quite intensively on Jung. And I think that Jung has started to come uh, well, he's not going to make his way back into the academy a bit like Clark's. Uh, he's too much of a fringe cover there, uh, f uh, too much of a fringe figure in that respect. Uh, but he's coming back into the center of interest of people who, outside the university, want to think, want to discuss, and want to deal with difficult questions. So I think there are the three strands the psychoanalytic, the occult mystical, um, experiential, one might want to say, um, and then the ac academic as well. And the academic one, I think, has, has received a real boost. Uh, through the through the publication of the Red Bull, because you can point to something and say, well, this isn't simply another psychoanalytic doctrine. This is something like nothing else you've ever seen before. And I think even Jung's detractors would say that that's true of the Red Bull. Okay, okay. So, very simple question: Why is it called the Red Book or Liber Liber Novus? Liber Novus. Well, um, uh, uh, Liber Novus is the uh, the title that that Jung uh, chose for it. Uh, but it was known um, colloquially as the Red Book because what Jung does is to um, go and get some parchment, uh, as you do, going down the local art shop um, and quill pen and all the rest of it, um, and start getting going. Um, after he's had these experiences in 1913 and 14, and, and which continue, and he starts um, to transcribe them and to elaborate them and to create, um, in effect, a medieval manuscript. Uh, by writing in a medieval script and by doing these these beautiful paintings, very disturbing, I think, as a Russian state painting, um, which are kind of um, um, uh, uh, postmodern icons, might be one way of, de of describing it. Um, and and he, point, he binds all of these things together in the end in huge red leather covers. And, and, and that's why the work is known as, as, as the Red Book. Um, I think an important thing to mention here is that for a very long time, um, everybody, including people in the, in the young community, knew that the Red Book existed, but had never seen it. 
um, uh, so it acquired this sort of mythical status because you know you knew it was there. I think it was kept by the Jung family in um, some kind of a bank vault uh, somewhere. Uh, but but nobody. But there'd been a few extracts of it reproduced uh, at here and there. It was mentioned in the the biography that um, uh, Jung in effect authorized memories, dreams, reflections. Uh, but nobody had actually seen this thing. And of course, itself makes it absolutely fascinating. Like that sort of holy grail, we've heard about it, but we can't actually get um, and get and get to see it. Uh, but but some people did occasionally catch sight of it. It's been said that Jung used to show it to. Um, specially favoured um, Annelies Anne's of his. Uh, but there's a great story that's told about um, the young expert um, uh, uh, Richard Hull, I mean, who did an awful lot of, uh, of, of translating of Jung's works in the neglected edition. Um, and he recalls um, actually being shown this by Jung's secretary, uh, Annie Leaffe. Um, and, uh, and Hull's reaction uh, looks at it and he says, I'm not surprised Jung keeps it under lock and key. Um, uh, it's it's like it's like um, uh, full of it's something full of mad real mad drawings with commentaries in monkish script, and and I think there is this sense of of, of surprise when one actually looked at it. I was surprised when it first came out and was, was published. I think almost everybody else was, um, and I think in the case of some uh, of analysts, they will have um, had uh, had a particular difficulty in coming to terms with it because it really does show how uh, Jungian therapy is on this knife edge. It, I mean, it is a practice. It is something which, which claims to have therapeutic benefit, but it also has this incredible source, uh, which, is like, which is like nothing else. Um, and I do remember that one of the people who uh, organized one of the first uh, conferences on the Red Book in, in San Francisco, telling, to me, telling me how he'd um, gone and done an uh, interview in a radio studio um, about the Red Book, and had left it in his car afterwards, and didn't go back. Didn't want to go back and collect it because he was quite he was quite pleased to collect it there. And I think that kind of shows two things about the Jungian community: um, both, you know, their sense of surprise, shock, horror when coming to terms with the book, but which is quite understandable, but also their honesty in dealing with that. And I think that there have been that some of the most frank discussions um, about the Red Book have come out of the Jung community as well. It's not a tension, I would say, of mystic versus psychoanalytic versus academic but it's a case where three different approaches can can all merge together to try and make sense of what this book's about mm -hmm. it's it's funny the, the the first impressions that you have of the book because mine was is Jung attempting to sort of write a second bible the the style in which it's written the 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 visual style as well in which it's written uh, especially uh, and as well with the latest readers edition is almost a replication of a biblical style and i think this is probably a really big question because the book itself is specifically dealing with christ christianity belief and myth in a certain way so in what sense is this a religious book yeah um that that's really the hundred million dollar question i think <laughs> isn't it about it um uh, yes, it is for a biblical echo. That's absolutely right. And of course, it, it starts off with these um, uh, biblical passages um, uh, from the Old Testament prophets, Jewish Jewish te uh, Jewish scripture prophets, um, uh, but, but but texts which are also used liturgically in the season of Advent. Um, and, and so there is this deliberate situ situating of the book within a Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, at, at, but yet, at the same time, there are also lots of echoes of very non-Christian and non-biblical texts. Um, there is the figure of Isdubar, meant to be um, a Gilgamesh. Um, there are also echoes, and it's hard not to, to, to hear them, uh, of uh, Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. And, and I think that kind of playing with biblical language, playing with um, biblical metaphors, biblical rhetoric is probably the best way to put it. Um, uh, that for me is very, very reminiscent of, of Zarathustra. Uh, Zarathustra is a kind of anti-Bible. It's written in a quasi-Lutheran biblical language, but it's plainly not um, a, 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 a pro-Christian text. More ambiguous, I think, in the case of Jung, that he is really debating what we have received through the, through the Christian tr tradition not only the Christian tradition, and that's why I think it's it's not simply an, an anti-Bible or an, an apocryphon, I suppose it might be one way of uh, putting it. Um, it. It is something which is, I think, 
like nothing else. And it is it encouraging us to take a new view of our Christian um, heritage, but you couldn't say that it was a Christian book in that sense. In that sense, what is Jung's relationship with the God, uh, not the God, sorry, the Bible and God in the, in the Christian tradition? Uh, but actually, I think I, th- I think that's a very sig- significant slip that you make there <laughs> because that's because that's actually the language that Jung uses, isn't it? That he he does talk about the God uh, and how I how Jung has to give birth to the God and and so on. I, th- I think that's absolutely right. Um, and 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 to, and to my mind, there is no question that he is dealing with um, the question of what does religious experience mean. But he's doing it in a a very knowing. Um, and a uh, very self-reflective way. It, 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 is, it is a quest for God. Um, and, and in that sense, um, one could say, well, it, it not only fits into a kind of biblical pattern, but also into a very Germanic literary tradition as, as well. Um, we've talked about Zarathustra, God is dead, so what are we going to do now? Um, um, I think there's also plenty of references in the text to, to Goethe's Faust, the descent to the mothers. And of course, Goethe's Faust is again a reckoning with the Judeo-Christian tradition. Here you have this guy, Faust, who's in league with the devil. And what does Goethe do? He meet, At the end, Faust is saved. So it's a complete inversion of the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. Uh, you have the deliberate echoes of the Book of Job um, at, at the beginning of Faust. Um, and of course, I suppose, um, one of the key questions that's posed in Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parsifal is uh, what is God? And, and that question which the early Parsifal quest uh, posed is, that seems to me is the question that Jung is investigating as well. So one might say that it's, it's a culmination of a Germanic approach to a set of religious questions. There's something interesting you said there, which I, early on, which I actually really agree with, but it just came up again there, that you said that it's um, a quest for Jung. The book is a quest and he's, mm-hmm. He's yeah. heading out, not to sound too cheap, but on a, on a journey, which makes it sound a little bit cheap. But I will just say that something you said at the start resonated with how I feel when reading the book, which is this is Jung throwing himself headlong, not only into madness, but into the possibility of meeting the abyss, going through. I would, I would, I guess you could over, overarchingly say, going through whatever it is. And I'm actually reminded of... Uh, Seven, Jung and the Seven Sermons of the, the Dead by mm. is it Stefan Müller? Yeah. 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 Uh, Stefan Hörler. Hörler. And in that where one of Jung, Jung is talking to one of his um, patients and he says that the only way out of their depression is through it. And this book does seem like a journey through hell mm. for Jung. Oh, uh, yeah. I just wondered if, if you could expand on that idea of, of what... Is, is hell the traditional hell for Jung, or is there something else which we could connect to his psychoanalytical uh, studies, which is which is like a personal hell, a personal yeah. journey? Um, uh, that's again a very good question. Um, I, I think one way to one way to approach it is to is to think that you know, particularly at the moment, it's it, it's about the hell that's going on um, all around us. Uh, there, there was an interesting comment that was made by the um, British Jungian Andrew Stamels when the Red Book was first published. He, um, he, uh, he was interviewed on Radio 4, um, and he says this about it. He says, it's not just an archival document, it's a very contemporary document. Um, it says a lot about what's wrong with modern society. It's about why living in the kind of society we've got right now drives you crazy. Because the inner world, what you've got going on inside you, is not listened to, not wanted on board. We live in a flattened, regulated, controlled society that's also actually out of control, as the economic crisis shows. Uh, because saying that in about 2009, we can now say a world that's out of control as the pandemic shows. So we're more out of control than ever. And the reason why I thought that's a helpful quotation is because really Jung is addressing the hell that we're all going through all the time. Uh, it, it's both a personal hell uh, for Jung, it has its own personal contours, but I think he's, it, it's presented as something which is, again, like the quest. There is an adventure that you have to go through. There will be different adventures for different people, but you're going to have to go through some kind of an adventure. And Jung's idea, I think, is to say, and he's very interested in the various apocalyptic and apocryphal traditions of the harem of hell, is this idea of the descent into the depths. And again, we're back with Gertrude Faust and into the mothers, into the chaos, into the primordial, into the archaic. 
uh, it's about, he, it's presented in his, uh, in Memories, Dreams, Perfections as a moment where he says, now I'm going to let myself drop. So it, it, it's going into that vortex, that hellish vortex of despair and absurdity, and but then working one way, one's way out of it again. And I think that, and, and it's hard work because look at the size of this red book, which is never entirely completed. It's in three sections, Liber Primos, Liber Secundus, and the, the Prufung and the Scrutinies. Um, but it's never actually finished. And I think that's Jung's way of saying, even if we come out of hell, we, we, we never get entirely away from it. We're always going to, he then becomes interested in, in alchemy, Gnosticism, so on. It, that We're always going to have to uh, work our way out of that hell. But um, he explicitly uses images of descent, um, of crucifixion, um, uh, particularly disturbingly, the figure of a crucified Christ with a serpent coming out of the mouth. And, and he identifies with that crucifixion. And I think that um, when people talk about, well, you know, you have to write it, you have to, you have to engage on what Thomas Kempis calls the imitation of Christ, again, a source that's referenced in the text, is just how difficult and problematic that imitation is. Mm -hmm. And the question of Christ is a really interesting one because perhaps this is a very, well, this is a very, very specific question. But for me, Jung's Christ, at least in the Red Book, um, is almost synonymous with Nietzsche's Christ in the sense that one needs to uh, not abide, but needs to follow the word of Christ and the way in which Christ specifically lived and not the Christ of the church or the Christ of a congregation or the Christ of, um, shall we say, you know, you, of Christianity TM, but the, the word of Christ itself. And do you think that there's a reason why that is important for Jung in this text, that one needs to differentiate the way they compose themselves in the world away from the church. Uh, I, yes, I think that's right, and um, it. I think I think Jung. I think Jung would be very impatient with uh, the kind of um, uh, you know the Archbishop of Canterbury doing Zoom uh, meetings from his from his kitchen. I think he'd say, "No, no, you, you guys got it all wrong," and 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 so. Um, uh, and uh, one also reads comments from from people within the Church of England in particular who talk about how the totally administered society is making its way through there. And Jung, again, his point about the controlled society, which is in fact out of control, that, that seems to fit uh, perfectly well into this uh, into this analysis. So that's absolutely spot on. The Christ that Jung is interested in is, is, is not the one that is uh, institutionalized. Uh, and I think it's very clear that, that Jung has his difficulties with institutionalized religion. You can see that in two ways. Um, both in the stories that are told in Memories, Dreams of Reflections, the, the, the famous incident of the vision that he's meant to have of God defecating on the, on the roof of Basel Cathedral. If that isn't anti-institutional, I don't know what is. Um, uh, his disappointment when he has his first communion is really what it's all about. Of course, he has the, he has the father who is a pastor and, and has his doubt, a bit like Nietzsche has, has, has the father and, and, he finds this religious heritage both personally and culturally problematic. Uh, so I think that's one example. And, and yet at the same time, Jung is fascinated uh, by the symbolic dimension of, of Christianity. Um, and I think one very clearly sees that in volume 11 of the collective works, his discussion of the transformation symbolism of the, of the mass, for instance. Um, and, and, and Jung is very, very interested in, in the figures that are around the Christian tradition. Um, so the mystics, Meister Eckhart, for example, um, uh, the apocryphal texts, the Gnostic texts. So, yeah, anything which is not standard and conventional, mm. that, really gets his, that really gets his interest. Because his sense is that um, the living message of um, not simply Christianity, but what he sees as authentic spiritual experience can't be found within these institutional forms. Would this connect us to the, the, the two sort of forms of spirit that, that uh, Jung mentions over and over again in the book. So you have the the spirit of the well, the contemporary spirit of the times, and then a more a more ancient spirit. So you have these two spirits, and it seems you know one is clearly in the present, and that would, uh, I think, as I understand it, would connect with any whatever institution in the way in which they're interpreting and appropriating or reappropriating the myths. Whereas the ancient spirit is the one which is going to be connected to the unconscious, to um, archetypes and to sort of 
perhaps these aren't the right words, but eternal truths. And in connecting oneself with institutions, you're just allowing the contemporary spirit to tell you how to read things, how to process um, what it is that the the universe is telling you or the world is telling you. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I mean, it is it is a, con- a continual theme uh, throughout the Ray book. It, it, it's introduced very, very on in the in the first chapters. This tension between between the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, uh, and and the spirit of the dead. And um, and and I think that relates to something that Jung described described uh, for Jung or ascribed to him uh, in Memories, Genes, Reflections, of this sense of him having two personalities. One of the personalities being in the here and now. And the other being the the eternal or the archaic or the primordial. Um, And I think it's interesting that here, this is expressed in a kind of projected form as a way of describing how we find ourselves, as it were, both caught up uh, in our own individual personal narratives um, and finding ourselves situated um, in the prejudices, the assumptions, uh, the values of uh, of our own age and our own time, the spirit of the time, and yet also the sense which pervades Jung's work, and, and not just his, that there is another dimension as well. Uh, and that is the spirit of the debt, which is, as you say, primordial, archaic, um, eternal, whether we can describe it as truth or not. But it is, it is that sense of, of otherness, which is yet also part of us. And I think that what he's trying to do is to say we have to come to an accommodation in these things. Um, so that the spirit of the times doesn't completely uh, gain control of us um, under the illusion that we're having control, but it isn't the spirit of the times. And we have to engage with the spirit of the depths, which is going to remind us. And, you know, it's so full of German romanticism, this, isn't it? The whispers in the forest and the sound of nature calling to us that we're different from who we think we are, that we have lost um, or become blinded to our true identity in some way. But I think that Jung's point is not simply that you abandon the spirit of times and go off with the spirit of the depth, but the spirit of the depth is also a bloody frightening thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not an easy experience. It's not, oh, I, I'd like to go and check in with that. But in fact, it's, it's, it's profoundly disturbing. And that's what makes the Red Book, I think, even though one appreciates more and more um, its artistic, its, its rhetorical elaborateness and construction, but it's nevertheless um, an, an extraordinary and, and, and in many ways terrifying experience because the spirit of the depths is frightening as well. And, and what Jung wants us to do is to come to terms with this uh, spirit of the depths, whilst at the same time realizing we, we, we do find ourselves in a particular here and now, and we've got to come to an accommodation between them. And in many ways, I think one can read Jung in psychology as trying to accommodate both of those dimensions. Um, the therapeutic, you know, help, I'm going mad, and what do I do about it? But also that sense of, well, if you're in a mad system, there might be a, a more sane kind of madness which would be inappropriate. So these sort of three forms of spirit that we have going on, the, the spirit of the times, the spirit of the depths, and then the the balancing act between the two. So you, do, you don't want to get too caught up in either one. Is this, I mean, I'm assuming this must have come up in... The Jung scholarship at some point is this Jung's almost de-edipalized appro- reappropriation of the id, the ego, and the superego. Well, I I th- I think that um, in a way we've introduced that 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 triad um, into Jung rather than in, in Freud. But I think you're right to say that it is a a crucial adjustment to to, to what Freud sees himself as doing. Freud, of course, is, is, is no stranger to the archaic dimension. I mean, this is the whole thing that he talks about uh, in his letter to Roman Roland, where he talks about the oceanic feeling, and he goes wandering on the Acropolis, and he has this sense of this, this archaic dimension of, of time. But for Freud, that is that's something which is um, problematic and ultimately infantile. Um, that's, that's, that, that's the way that he wants, to, he wants to dismiss it. And I think his, his whole sense is that we have to come to an accommodation between uh, the claims of the ego, which he wants to assert over against the id, which is infantile, and then those um, introduced societal values, which he calls the, the superego. Um, I think Jung's view is um, rather more rather more binary, but therefore enables a different kind of synthesis, which is to say we are both in the here and now, and there is this archaic dimension, and we have to we have to simply we have to realign them. In the right, in the right way, it's not an opting for one or the, or the other. It's a question of how do we align both of those things, 
and to see that the spirit of the depths is not something that can be ignored um that's that's why jung's personal adventure which is something he's undergoing in the red sits also in a complicated way with the world historical events which are going on around him which is of course the first world war um and and i think that there is a very important societal political dimension to what uh, to what jung is saying which is that um, there is a kind of relationship of microcosm and macrocosm that exists between the individual and, and society. Um, and that society must learn from the individual, but also the individual from society. And we have, to, we have to see this plunging into chaos and into hell that happens in the Red Book. Well, what else is the First World War rather than a plunging into chaos and hell? So um, I, I think those two dimensions are something which Hume wants to give us a great appreciation of the relationship between them. And in what sense do you think that Jung feels that we should... It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Freud's, uh, should we say, realisation of this deeper aspect of time at the Acropolis. Jung also sort of channels this appreciation of time, of deep time, of ancient time, or I guess you could say depth time. Do you think that is the way to almost mediate between these two spirits is in an understanding of the deep time? I, I, I think that form of mediation, uh, on my reading of it, which um, may be an entirely incorrect one, uh, is that it takes form in the realm of the aesthetic, in the realm of uh, aesthetic construction, which is what the Red Book is an instantiation of. Um, in other words, it is, a, it is a working through of those tensions in a form that speaks to the entire individual, um, because it speaks to both feeling and affect uh, as, as, as well as to intellect. Um, it involves an exploration of those experiences, um, but also a coming to terms and a representation of them. So I, I, it, it's not as if art is simply an escape mechanism. Um, and of course, that's often an accusation that's, that, that's made of a certain school of aesthetics that um, it's using art as a way to, to get out of that conflict between the individual and, and society. But I, I, I'd rather see Jung as participating in a, a tradition argued for by proponents like Herder and Goethe and Schiller, which sees art as having a very, very important function uh, to play in, in, in society. Um, for instance, in psychological types, um, which, which is um, the first major work that Jung writes uh, when he's come out of the experience of the 10 years of writing the Red Bull. Uh, psychological times includes a very long discussion, um, both of Nietzsche again, uh, and the birth of tragedy, but also Schiller's letters on uh, aesthetic education. Um, and, and again, the letters on this aesthetic education are about what is the role of art for society? What is the role of ethic, uh, of, of aesthetics in society? Is there an ethical dimension to, to aesthetics? I might think, well, this is, that's all very different from what's happening in the Red Book, but it seems to me you've got a, you've got a theoretical working through um, uh, and Schiller's part of something that Jung went through. And that's why Jung is so interested in, in Schiller in, in, 19, in 1921. It's because he finds an explanation there um, of, of what he's going through. Let's remember that Jung is very interested in art and talks about it. Volume 15 of the, of the collected works is about his writings on, on aesthetics. And we find there in his article on psychology and literature, the distinction that he makes. So we've got another binary, um, uh, spirit of the time, spirit of the depths. He talks about the two different kinds of art, one of which he calls psychological and the other which, which he calls visionary. Uh, but the psychological one that he means is simply is, is to do with um, consciousness and control. The one that he's really interested in, of course, is, is, is the visionary one. And I think we can read, we can use, um, uh, Jung's essay on psychology and literature and Schiller's a treatise on the aesthetic education of humankind as theoretical prisms through which we can approach the Red Book but because we need some kind of approach to it really I mean as you've said you've, you know what must looking for pathways into it and this I think is a very helpful one because after all it's the one that Jung himself provides. It's interesting this idea of visionary aesthetics because it it it's already reminding me and I'm uh, I'm hoping people who listen to this episode listened to our um episode on Ludwig Klages. If you haven't, I'll put a, a link in the description. But it reminds me of Klagian images of mm. this theoretical alteration of representation 
in which the phenomena we are given has a further depth to it in its reality as a, as an image as as apart from the spirit as uninvaded from the spirit as accepting the phenomena as the true reality in which we should investigate and is there something in this which is the same as jung but jung has sort of alterations in from this in terms mm. of what he how he understands what an image is mm. um I, again that's i think that's a very helpful observation james and i think um uh, I, I think you're synthesizing um, Clarkesian and Jungian approaches in, in uh, exactly the kind of thing which I, I think would be the right way of understanding them. Um, yet you're absolutely right that um, uh, Jung starts off by talking about the archetype um, as uh, as an Urbild. Um, and, and of course, that's the expression that we find with Clarkers. Mind you, I think they, they, they come at it entirely independently or they, they come out of a, a common intellectual uh, tradition. Um, after all, you know, Goethe talks about the Urpflanzer and so on. So this, this idea of, of Urness um, is um, uh, something which is very comfortable to the, Ger the German tradition, but I don't think it's one of them taking, taking from the other, but rather than, and, and, and I'm not saying that they're identical in their um, conceptual structure, but you're absolutely right that there is a fundamental similarity between them, which is that an Urbild, uh, or what Jung later calls an, an, an archetype, um, has a, a symbolic dimension to it. I think it is the symbolic dimension which is so in incredibly powerful. And the whole point about a symbol is that it, 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 it's more than a sign. And that's why it marks out these thinkers, Clarkers and Jung and, and others, um, as completely outside the, the very restricted semiotic scope, which has so, so governed um, academic discourse in the, in the 20th century. That's not the game that they're playing at all. Uh, they're interested in, 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 in symbolism. Um, and, and to this extent, I'd, I'd also align both Clarkers uh, and Jung uh, with a thinker like Ernst Cassirer, um and his philosophy of symbolic forms. And the interesting thing about Cassirer is, is that Cassirer is um, polite company that you could invite round for dinner. I mean, Cassirer is absolutely fine in terms of his credentials, nothing murky, nothing mystical, nothing anti-Semitic hmm. at, at all. Um, but actually also, he too has found it difficult, I think, getting traction in the postmodern seminar room. Um, and he's often, I think, surprisingly left out of account of um, cultural theory uh, in the 20th century. So it's the symbolic dimension that these thinkers are articulating and which is the clue into how they think that they've got something which is important for us. Why do you, why do you think it is that these, I mean, I, I could list other thinkers who have dealt with the same thing, uh, René Girard, uh, Makia Eliad, potentially Choron, this whole uh, cadre of thinkers who have taken the symbolic dimension seriously are the ones who are left out. Do you think that there, are, there might potentially be a connection there that there's something in that non-materialist understanding of the symbolic dimension which is just antagonistic to contemporary methods of study? You're absolutely right that it's um, what one could, one could list uh, you know, that, that there's a whole sort of um, alternative academy uh, which is which is ignored by the by the, the standard academy um, uh, I don't think it's so much that this alternative academy is antagonistic rather it is the the, the, the semioticians um, and the postmodernists are antagonistic towards something which escapes their boundaries but I think you can see an awful lot of of, of modern literary modern philosophical discourse about about trying to to control and clamp down to tame and neutralize um and of course the symbol doesn't do that it, it's always it's always going to escape whatever interpretive framework you you put around it um and so i think the reason why these people are unpopular is because they they um they're, they're not reductive um they're not materialist in that um technical sense um uh, they are pro-intuitive and that's seen as, pro as problematic. And of course, they are interested in irrationality as well. Uh, yeah, I was about to say they're irrational. And exactly. <laughs> but of course, their irrationality is is is, is less irrational <laughs> than the irrationality of those who are pointing the fingers at them, because they're saying, yeah, there are there, there is an irrational uh, dimension. If they'd used a term like absurd, they'd have got away with it. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but they're saying, yes, there is this um, uh, irrational dimension, 
uh, which is at the same time also you know, um, a, a sensory, a, a sensuous, a, a physical and affective uh, dimension. That's part of our lived reality. That's what they're all pointing towards. But the, the open, their honesty is always the case that an honest person opens themselves up to all sorts of accusations. And I think that their honesty in, in acknowledging this, uh, this realm, just as we find um, an, an interest in the, in, in the haptic, uh, the visual, uh, the linguistic, the rhetorical in the in, in, in the Red Bull um, opens it up to this to this charge of well, this is just bathing in irrationality. But they're not doing that at all. And of course, the warning that they make is is if you repress the irrational, then it comes back and gets you in another form. That also was Freud's warning as well, of course, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting what you mentioned with the the terminology of the absurd being allowed. And it makes me think that actually perhaps there's something there with respect to a sort of a controlling humanism in which if, if 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 one says oh it's absurd then it's absurd in relation to your perspective so you're still in control because you've said this is absurd but i know it's absurd whereas the irrational and the unconscious the jungian and the freudian unconscious these aren't things you know freud famously many people have said another copernican revolution because can we're not the sorry copernicus we're not the center of the universe can we're not the center of our Perception, Freud, we're not even the centre of our own mind. So irrationality is the almost the admittance of not an antagonistic inhumanism, but something where you finally can say there may be something which is just completely other from our entire perception, but and we are just a, sort of a node being dragged into it occasionally. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, uh, there, there, there is a book with, with the title, something along the lines of we've, we've had 100 years of psychoanalysis and, and, and we're still not better. Um, <laughs> you could maybe also say something like, you know, we've had half a century of postmodern semiotics uh, and we're not getting any better either. Um, and, and, and I think that um, what these what these people have, have to offer is, uh, a, a, you know, is, is a more honest approach is a more constructive approach. It, it is to do with about acknowledging another, the other. Uh, and, um, and so it is peculiar that that language of the other has been you know, hijacked by Lacan and by the postmodernist thinkers, and again, tamed and reduced and turned into, Lacan talks about you know, a, a symbolic dimension or a realm of the symbolic, but he doesn't really mean that. He, he, he's really using it in the sense of something which is, which is semiotic. Um, so he's trying to hijack that, uh, that, that, that Jungian terminology. Um, and that sense of otherness, of course, is central at the same time also to the religious tradition. I mean, what else is God other than that 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 other uh, uh, writ large? And so I think where we were talking earlier about Jung's engagement with, with, with religion in general and Christianity in, in particular, I think that's also part of this question of, of acknowledging uh, the, reaction, the irrational, uh, acknowledging there is something which, which, which reason cannot capture. Um, and in the case of all these symbolic thinkers, they're saying, well, you know, reality is something that reason cannot capture. Um, and, and Jung's trying to say, well, and as part of that reality is this sense of God, which we can't capture either. And of course, that's the whole point of God. Um, you have a rational understanding of him, or at least if, you, if you're Thomas Aquinas, you have a rational understanding of him, but you couldn't say, well, we have absolutely captured rationally the totality of God. It isn't gonna be there. So maybe this is simply a reworking through in a post-death of God secular society of issues about the otherness of God, which can't be dealt with in theology, and so have ended up uh, being discussed in uh, literary theory and in philosophy. Do you think that's where, with the Red Book specifically, Jung sort of begins one's journey into serving themselves, or as he says, uh, serving one's soul, is that you need to have you need to begin from this acceptance of there is going to be something which is I was recently do, recently did an interview and uh, the, the guest Hans Gerding said the ultimate can't be known and I wonder if that applies to Jung that there there has to you have to begin from this un, irrational understanding or at least an understanding that there is these facets of the irrational which are going to sort of engulf you in a complete well, you, well, I can't articulate it because it's not going to be something I ever can articulate. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's right. I, that, that phrase, it's a very powerful phrase, isn't it? In the, uh, the, on, the sur- in, on, on the surface of the soul, isn't it? In some way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like a James Bond movie that never got made. I don't know. Um, uh, but it, the context of it is, he says, um, uh, in the chapter called On the Surface of the Soul, he says, I am the servant of a child. 
my soul is a child and my God in my soul is a child. And I, I think here that what we've got Jung is, is going back to um, a kind of thought that we find with Meister Eckhart. Um, first of all, that language about service of the soul, I mean, that is so very medieval. Again, we've got the grail and the idea that you work in the service of, of the grail, that's where you want, want to be. Um, and there is a lot of grail and, and, and medieval night imagery uh, present in the, in the Red Book. The idea of God in my soul being, being a child, um, I, I think, is, is, is Jung's um, reference or allusion uh, to, to Meister Eckhart. Um, there's a story uh, which, which Jung himself refers to in a much later work, Answer to Job, um, uh, which shows great continuity between the early concerns of the Red Book, the later work, Stein 52 of Answer to Job. Um, and that's to say, it's, it's Meister Eckhart's uh, vision of a child. There, there is this story, um, uh, which is attributed to Meister Eckhart, uh, that he sees God as, as the divine child. Um, and he dialogues with him. And again, this idea of dialoguing with the soul, dialoguing with God, there is something essentially dialogic about the Red Book, which is so often this dialogue with the, uh, with the soul. Um, and he has a very brief interchange um, uh, with God as the as the child, um, and at the end, God child vanishes, and Meister Eckhart says, "What what had happened was it was God Himself having fun with him." Um, and I think this idea of, but it's a very serious kind of fun. It's a very serious kind of joke. It's a very serious kind of dialogue that's that's taking place. And I think that this is the passage that's informing Jung's concept of being in the service of the soul, which is in the service of the child, which is the God within the soul. And that's, that's again, how he's reviving a medieval mystical uh, tradition, which at the same time, okay, it's, it has an irrational dimension to it, but is enormously complicated, carefully constructed. Um, to dismiss Meister Eckhart as irrational in, would be an, an appalling kind of um, intellectual vandalism, not to recognize the the intricacy of the argumentation and the thought processes which are there. And I think that that part of Meister Eckhart has been taken over, and that's what Jung is dealing with in those passages. So do you think that's where, for Jung, one could begin to understand meaning in relation to their life and purpose is in relation to this serving what the child would need? I I, I think that it's a, a coming to terms with... Um, the, the the apparent absence of the other um of of, of this otherness um and, and that's why again you know Nietzsche expresses it uh, in this extraordinarily powerful way um by by not simply being an atheist not simply a thinker who says um uh, there is no god um that's already need an easy and tidy that's a logical proposition but instead uh, much more dramatically and much more viscerally says uh, god is dead and of course, in the famous parable from from the gay science one two five, God is, and we have killed him, and that's the point. Um, now, this killing of God, which uh, which Nietzsche talks about, is something that I think Jung is very very keen and responding to, and one can one can see that in numerous passages in his work. I think it's also core to what he's doing uh, in the Red Book, because Jung is trying to work through well, what would it mean to give birth to God? Nietzsche and the killing. Jung and the giving birth again. And of course, that kind of religious uh, language is, is likely to set most people um, uh, running. Um, but, it's, but it's curious that sort of postmodern theology, people are very happy to talk about God in those contexts. But when Jung does it, then, then people get very iffy because, because Jung is really taking it seriously. I and mean, he, he really does mean uh, the through these things in a personal and serious way. It's strange that that happens, that it, we can still only sort of deal with it. As you say, you, earlier you were talking about semiotics and even these these abstract things such as, you know, the, there's the philosophers who do and the philosophers, even filmmakers who and, and writers who take things such as angels or spirits or the spirit or myths in a, in a serious manner. Just no one else can ever accept that. And it has to be this sort of semiotic idea of, it's just language and we're just trying to abstractly explain something. Whereas I think perhaps that that's one of the other um, things with Jung, that there is actually no point where you could find a way to work it, that he's just using language because it's very, very clear that he isn't, he is dealing with, with yeah. apparitions, which are absolutely real to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I 
I, I think that's a very valid point. And, and one of the things that um, <clears throat> someone who's written a, a very length, lengthy commentary on, on Jung and on the Red Book, um, uh, Peter Kingsley, uh, in his, um, his recent book, um, Catafalc, um, the idea that, that there is a kind of uh, catafalque as a funeral stand is that there is some sense we're approaching that Jung is a prophet of the end of, end of humanity. It's a, it's, it's a provocative but, um, but enticing thesis. Uh, and, and he makes this point that there is a very, very raw experiential dimension to, work, uh, to what Jung is going through. And then I think, of course, then it's up to each of the readers uh, to say to themselves, well, well, is that an experience? Does that match or map onto anything that I've experienced? Um, uh, it, it, it's not as if you have had to go into hell in, in, order to, in order to understand the Red Book, but it might open up the possibility of it. Again, I think that's why there is this reluctance to engage with Jung and engage with, with the Red Book, is that it's, it is very, very powerful stuff. And I think that people work very, very hard at trying to, at trying to resist that. Um, and, uh, and, and it's curious in a way that, that even people uh, I had a wonderful time last, uh, last summer um, at the University of Saarbrücken, where they've, uh, they've got a nice postgraduate uh, working group, research group, uh, which is working on dreams. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, and I thought, well, if I only could get one of them to read the Red Book, then I'd have achieved something. And, and I'm, sad, I'm sad to say, I think I failed, um, <laughs> even though they very kindly gave they did lectures, because there is something, there, there is resistance there. And sure, you know, um, we've only got so much time to, uh, uh, to spend reading things or talking about things or to this or that or the other. Um, but Jung, I think, is, is someone who is deliberately included and kept and kept away. And it's strange that even people who are working in those in those areas, um, which you would think would give them an appreciation of his of his significance, it's seen as something which is too problematic. But I think that is because, as we've said before, there is this larger framework within academia of domestication, of taming, and controlling, and containing. And I think that's what and, and Jung's Red Book, because it's so bloody large, kind of explodes that dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add um, specifically about the Red Book or any sort of perhaps advice for reading the Red Book that you would, you would like to add in? I, I, I think my advice would be um, uh, uh, take it bit by bit. Um, I, 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 think, I think it is a book which is a kind of, um, it, it is an experience in itself. Um, there, there, there's been long, I talked about the book by Peter Kingsley, there have been other studies that are written, there is a series of books um, edited by Thomas Stark from Murray Stein on Jung uh, and his relevance for our time. Uh, th th there's a burgeoning secondary literature there, but I think the thing too is to read the Red Book um, and then read it again and then read it again. <laughs> um, and I think that it, it, it is something which can't be appreciated in one go. In, in that respect, it's, it's rather like any large building uh, or, or like a city. That, you know, you go to a city and um, you can have a good time, but you would never go to a city, you wouldn't go to Paris just for one weekend and say, well, you know, that's, that's it, I've done that. Well, some people, but, you know, you, you go back to Paris, or London or, or Glasgow or wherever, and you, you always discover more about your city. And I think that is what I would say is, is, is the Red Book, is the experience is like that of visiting a city or to use the kind of image that Jung himself uses. It's like visiting a building. It's like visiting the cathedral. Um, and, uh, and there is a quotation um, from uh, attributed to, to Jung from one of his uh, analysands, Christiana Morgan, uh, that Jung says he says you should you should make your own red book, and that's possibly that is possibly the best answer. You should do that, and as you turn over its pages, you will be in your own church, you will be in your own cathedral, the silent places of your spirit, where you will find renewal. Um, and so I think it possibly the best answer to the Red Book would be to go and make one's own. Uh, that seems like a good place to finish up. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Paul. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.